Thank you, John. A year ago, the phone rang. Angela Merkel called. She said she had read my book, Data for the People. And she said she liked it. And she was wondering whether it could help her to, in her words, ermuntern, to uh, you know, encourage her, and to, uh, uh, how to translate that? Actually, I admire how you did this before. Um, to inspire her, what she can do in Germany about the gap, this increasing gap that has formed between Germany and the United States. Think about it, no really good company is in Germany on the internet. So when we talked about it, we thought what we should have as a focus is mindset. In her words, the positive mindset of actually getting people not just to come up with arguments why something won't work, but maybe to develop some things that might work. And we call this people for the data as a parallel to data for the people. Now, the reality was quite different because it turned out that not everybody really wants to hear that. And uh, I would think it was of mixed success of what we as Digitalrat could achieve. But the benefit for you is that I've spent many, many days of my life thinking about it, and I'm going to compress this now in a few minutes. At the heart of this is what I call the data dilemma. A dilemma is something which can't just be resolved, but which is intrinsic. And it exists on a number of different levels. On the lowest level, it's the level of the individual. David Brin said, the data dilemma is that everybody wants transparency for everybody else and privacy for themselves. That sucks. So the same is true on organizations and the same is even true for society. So what do we do about it? My view is that what we need to do about it is we need to learn. We need to become more data literate. For that, I have a story too from our chancellor. We had dinner and you know, we chat about, I sat next to her, we chat about kinds of stuff and then she started talking about history. And I actually don't know that much about history. And I said, at some stage, uh, how do you know this? And she looks at me and says, Wikipedia. I just was curious today and I read about it. You're the first one I'm sitting with, so I thought I'll tell you about it. <laughs> and that was so charming to see that somebody has no pretense. <laughs> so I wanted to learn about today. And hey, that's how I learned about it. So that curiosity, I think, is one of the most important things that we can have to be curious about you know, things. And I'm surprised how little I actually know. For example, uh, today, I want to know how does my headset work? There's a button with plus, which makes it louder, and a button with minus, and I had no idea. So, guess I went to Wikipedia, and I looked it up, and it turns out it's just a fixed resistor which they put in. If it's 200 ohms, it goes up. If it's a kilo ohm, it goes down. So it all makes sense. But there are so many things which you actually don't know. So for me, curiosity drives everything. But back to the question of democracy and literacy and what I call data literacy. So when you look me up, you find a few strange photos. For example, the day after the last election of the United States, when Trump got elected, there's a picture of Vladimir Putin and me, where I'm in Moscow. And 
I won't bore you with too many details, but I want to tell you about one detail from the conversation. So we were in a room, and then suddenly Hermann Greff, the head of Spare Bank, he, his phone rang and he left the room. I thought, that is kind of weird. I mean, even here it would be kind of weird if someone leaves the room, let alone if it's just like five or six of us. And when he came back, I said, so what happened? You know, being Andreas, you know, why don't ask? I said, oh, we had an attack. An attack? Now, having had a house in China for 17 years, I sort of kind of knew what he was talking about. And having lived in the United States for the last 30 years, I know attacks come either from China or they come from Russia. And I was in Russia, so I blurted out and said, oh, that must have come from China. And he says, well, maybe think about it again. And I realized, of course, where the day after the election that attack to the computer system had come from. So, as I said, there are many interesting things. Uh, by the way, I also have a Stasi file. Uh, my dad was in prison in many years, imprisoned by the Stasi in Bautzen, one of the uh, prisons for political prisoners. So we can talk about those things on the panel. But what I want to talk to you about is literacy, how literacy has changed the world, no question about being able to read and write. And specifically, my mission is to increase data literacy, which means to be able not to interpret characters, but to interpret numbers, to interpret data. I should tell you a little bit about my background. So after growing up in Germany and doing my undergrad degree in Bonn, in physics, I came to Stanford for my PhD, and I did it in neural networks. I came into Stanford in 1986. So it wasn't that popular to do neural nets as it is now. Like this here is an example, Otter, which is just basically a neural net doing transcription in real time. I think it's pretty crazy. If the Stasi had us had that, they wouldn't have had so many people to work so hard. And think how a technology like Aura potentially changes how you think about yourself. Like in another meeting with Angela Merkel, I put my little MP3 recorder, this one here, right between her and me. So not out of my pocket or out of an umbrella or whatever the tricks were, just right there it was sitting. So I thought it was pretty obvious. At the end of the day, my handler, somebody from McKinsey, she said, you had your power bank in front of you all day long. I said, power bank? I have no power bank. Oh, you mean my MP3 recorder? And she almost dropped dead that I had recorded. My view is, why would anybody have a problem of recording a conversation? The premise of my book is, it starts with when everything is recorded. Assume that everything is recorded. So the laws we need to make, the rights we need to have is what can happen with this. And if somebody, so it's your Facebook, for instance, violates those, then we need to hit them hard. But we shouldn't make rules about what can be recorded or not. That, I think, is an uphill battle. So we as individuals need to have rights, data for the people. What we can do, and one of these rights is the right to transparency, the right to see the data I create. When I think about what do organizations need to do, then I have a flip side, the other side of these rights, which are rules for organizations. And in this example, for example, it is to embrace transparency. That means both internally, but also, of course, transparency to the outside world. As John mentioned, I was the chief scientist at Amazon. And I don't know whether you can imagine the discussions in the early years when there were some people who we thought we should allow every customer to write on the website. Isn't that crazy? They might say something negative about the product. I mean, we can't possibly allow, I mean, people to, and Jeff always has a perspective, what is the right thing from the consumer? And he says, well, when people make decisions what to buy or what not to buy, we want them to have the information 
And that's where the idea of reviews came from and made on the website. But that was not a non-controversial discussion with the manufacturers who didn't want negative things about their products to appear. Another rule which summarizes pretty well what I believe about data is the rule to respect and empower your customers. And if we think about what is democracy about, it's also about respect and empowering of people. So we had literacy, being able to read and write, to interpret marks on paper, and we have data literacy. So to bring it back here at the end of my little presentation, Angela Merkel asked me, so what do you think I should be doing? And I told her, find a teenager in your neighborhood, boy or girl, it doesn't matter, and spend an hour a month with them, just asking them what they do and how they do it. And just simply listen and observe. And you know, a McKinsey will not give you a report on teenagers. They will take lots of your money. But you know what that teenager will tell you, you can't really get otherwise. And I think for me, that's the role students play. Students are the ones who show me how things really work. And once you're in, why do I teach? I teach because I establish somehow the trust that you know this guy is a reasonable guy. And that's when they go and tell me how things really work in their world. So when we talk about data literacy here, the ability to understand you know, data, for me, that means to look at the world like a physicist, to understand what's possible, what's plausible, what's implausible, what's simply impossible, to not get fooled by that, to understand errors, all measurements have errors, as you see here probably in this transcript. And to understand how errors propagate. You know, to understand that there are feedback loops, like when I saw arrow rather than, rather than error, I thought maybe I need to enunciate more <laughs> properly. <laughs> so at the end of the day, when I was at Amazon, I always said, storage is free. Don't think about how much you need to pay to store data. I think compute power is free. Don't worry about how many cycles something uses. And if you do, you know, Amazon Web Service can help you out with your compute power. But <laughs> so what's left? And I think this is the most fundamental question we have. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the objective that we are trying to optimize? So I did my thesis on neural nets, and specifically what I did was to go beyond what everybody else did was mean squared error, maximization, optimization, to saying, can we have some other terms in our objective function so we can truly actually optimize something, but we need to capture what it is. So for democracy, I believe what we want is to want, as democratic societies, we want a discourse where we talk about the true trade-offs there are, what the weights are in, the you know, example, freedom to and freedom from. How much do we weigh this in a democratic process compared to that? And not to just to listen to people who tell you what you want, but to understand what the true trade-offs are, where we need to make trade-offs, what are the constraints, what are the constants, and also to identify the false trade-offs that some want us to believe. So I already gave you the one piece of advice I gave Angela Merkel to find that teenager. Now I want you to take a deep breath and to think, what do you think would be a specific task you could do to increase data literacy. We're all super fortunate to be here. What is one thing that each and every one of you 
could do where you think you could help make the world a little more data-literate place. Thank you for your attention.